Oh, uh, by the way, I said I was going to do a new series for, like, basically Q&A with Twitch chat for at the start of every stream, or some somewhere near the start of every stream. And I think the last 10 minutes will just be the first one to be uploaded to YouTube. You guys have been asking pretty good questions. Banana Slam Giant. So you said you watched my YouTube video on how armor counters minus armor. So how would you itemize differently against high armor with, let's say, Lifestealer? So let's say the person has 40 armor. So if you're considering Deso, right? That 6 armor is probably going to amp it by, let's just guesstimate. Let's say it amps the damage by 10 or 15% because they have so much armor. So at that point, it's better to just buy plus damage items. Like, it's just better to go... MKB or Daedalus or, you know, Butterfly. It's just better to go damage items rather than to go minus armor items. So the whole idea is that minus armor is something you either draft with or that you pay for with items. And the minus armor gives you a specific amount of bonus damage based on how much armor the person has. The more armor they have, the less percent bonus damage you're going to get from the minus armor. So at that point, instead of spending 3500 on a Deso, maybe it's better to spend 5000 on a Daedalus, right? Uh, that's the idea behind how the uh, armor video was meant to help you. So let's compare it then, right? So if it's 60 damage plus 10%, say you hit for 200. So then it's going to be 286 that you hit for. And so you gave yourself 86 damage. While well, on the other hand, this is 52 damage plus 75 magical. So at that point, isn't MKB better? Similar cost. Percent of you and all your teammates. Well then, of course. You have to factor in how many teammates of yours benefit from the Deso. So if you're like an Ember Spirit, it could be a bit different because you're hitting five targets with your Slide of Fist, so your Deso is being applied across the board. The point is, the more armor they have, the less impactful your minus armor is. And it just meant to weigh into the balance of what item you're supposed to go. Dota's just a lot about min-maxing. So if you're hitting five targets and amping them all by 15%, that still might be better than MKB, for instance, right? That's why oftentimes you'll see heroes like Ember going for for uh, Deso. But on the other hand, TA is really nice because she has Melt Strike. <coughs> so a lot of heroes are sitting at pretty low armor already after the Melt Strike. So Deso just works so well for TA. 100 magical? It's 75% chance to do 100, so it's effectively 75 Yeah, Mortal Razor, for sure. But the idea is you're choosing between what damage item to go. You're saying to yourself, I need damage. And then all I'm trying to tell you with this minus armor explanation is that, like, sometimes it's better to just go plus damage. Sometimes it's like Deso is the most impactful damage item you can buy. Like, but the, the point is that you understand how minus armor works so that you can be more aware, like, of when Deso is the right item to get. Uh, we're going to watch Axe. We're going to watch some Lulba. Slardar. Well, the problem with that, right, when you think of Deso, is that Deso also doesn't help you hit them any better. So you have to consider how many times you're actually going to hit them as well, based on getting kited. So that's why sometimes Diffusal will be a way better damage item than Deso, because the fact that you have the Diffusal active, and the fact that you're burning their mana so they can't, like, blink away on Anti-Mage or something, makes you effectively do more damage, because you're hitting them more. And that's, like, understanding the nature of getting kited and stuff. Isn't Drow a great counter for high armor heroes? Drow removes base armor, uh, not bonus armor. So against like Agi carries, sure, but against like Wraith King and shit that builds armlet AC, no, it's not that good. When playing offlane, should I always build some kind of ore item like either Pipe or Crimson? No, it's all about what your team needs from you. Does your team need initiation? Does your team need auras? Does your team need sustain? Does your team need just durability in the front line? You know, what does your team... Does your team need Roche? So you build, like, Vlad's Medallion? Like, what, what does your team need from you? 
usually the offlane's role is you you are the core that gets items like you're the hero on your team that gets items that are meant to enable everyone else but like if your team has no initiation and you're the only form of initiation then the way you're enabling your team is by enabling yourself to initiate right like that's how you enable your team because if your team can't make any moves because you have no catch then building aura items doesn't make any fucking sense right and that should come into play when you pick your hero. That should come into play when you buy your items. Like, having an idea of what role your hero is on the team. Thoughts on Helm of the Dominator being a more common pickup now that Vlad's is getting nerfed. That's how all these items always work, isn't it? There's always one of them that's broken. They're all, like, super valuable, 2, 000, approximately 2,000 gold items. And when they're all about the same cost, and they all do similar things, you know, like, there are auras for your team that buff people up in some way... The one that is most cost-effective is going to be purchased 90% of the time. That's just how the balance of those items works, sadly. It's very difficult to balance those items properly. What do you do if you're playing offlane, stomping your lane, but your other lanes are late-game focused and lose it? Ask yourself, is it best that I help those lanes directly, or is it best that I help them indirectly? Meaning... Do those heroes want me to make space for them by ganking and killing their lane, or do they want me to make space for them by forcing rotations and taking other towers? Do you feel like Vessel is the most bought item in Dota 2? Yeah, right now it's very good. I saw a couple high MMR players implying picking Void usually means the mid is more of the carry. Thoughts on this? Picking Faceless Void? Kind of depends. I'd say Faceless Void is is a late gamer, but he needs to be... He, like, enables other heroes to carry better, too. By watching a game instead of playing. Because we're chilling right now. We're just chilling, man. We'll play plenty today. It's a good game to watch. EG's just crushing. By a good game, I mean, I guess EG's just crushing. Mid lane is lost, technically. I don't think Invoker's supposed to beat Quop. What's the best way to grief your offlaner's lane as position 4? Uh, soak XP underneath their tower, never cut the creep wave, pick Pudge. I scream bloody murder. Why is Storm being picked so much? I'm not sure, honestly. Maybe it feels good in pubs or something. Picking a melee hero with no wave clear when they pick Bounty Hunter. That's a nice way to grief your offlaner. If your offlaner picks before you, you should 90% of the time pick a ranged hero. If they pick melee, if they picked a melee hero, you should pick ranged. It's almost always that way. There's a, there's a few exceptions. Like Tusk Pango was a strong lane at uh, ESL. Ask yourself if it's your job to secure the range for your, for your core. If it is, make sure it's secured. Do you feel like the change to movement speed is a big nerf to Weaver? Feel free to look at my patch review on YouTube absolutely free. TLDR, yes. Is Axe jungle still a thing? There's no jungling in Dota other than four position Enigma, which isn't really jungling. Do you miss the tri-lane meta? No, not really. Tri-lanes aren't particularly exciting. Just means like free farm for the carry and ass fucking for the offlane. Yeah, I, I told- I said that the nerf to Weaver was very significant. I love Coddle position 4. I think he's a 5, but I guess he could be ran as a 4, at least in pubs. <laughs> Is dragging the wave as position 4 equal in, in importance as pulling the lane as position 5? That's a very straightforward answer, sir. What does the lane look like if you don't pull and drag the creep wave? What does it look like if you do? Does that benefit you? There are a lot of matchups, it is very important to do so. That people do not. So in short, having knowledge of whether or not you are supposed to do that is just as important as having knowledge of when to pull as a 5 position. Yes, that would be my answer. What do you think about Alk offlane? Uh, he fits no description of what makes an offlaner. Does not apply pressure. Does not win his lane. I have a friend that says Darkseer is a top tier offlane that shuts down safe laners. Is that true? I would say Darkseer implies if there is a Darkseer picked prior to the carry getting picked, the carry will literally free farm every single game. I think Surge was a very strong spell last patch before the movement speed reworks. And I think, in my humble opinion, if I had to guess, Darkseer is now dog shit. 
they took off like 40 movement speed from Surge. Effectively. Pudge is literally unpickable if you care about winning the game of Dota 2. At the current moment. To answer your question, WYBU. There is never a game where the correct pick is Pudge. I feel clueless. Can you give an example where it's good to drag creeps? Uh, when the opponent's level 1 is far superior to yours. Like if I'm an offlane Timbersaw, potentially. Because you basically avoid laning against them for the first couple of creep waves. And then I get level 3 on Timbersaw, and I'm Gucci. How about Techie's offlane? He's just a better 4. I think he's actually a pretty good 4. How to play against Sniper mid. Learn when you are supposed to be aggressive, because Sniper is the best hero in the game for punishing lack of understanding of aggression. Sniper is really bad against illusion heroes, most notably Peel. I think you'd be safe to pick Peel against Sniper every single game. If you're getting last pick Sniper, reconsider picking carries that are good against Sniper. Meaning ones that can close gaps. Don't die to Sniper, just hitting them. So usually heroes with some sort of mobility to get away or to get on top of them. Interesting with his play how he's always clear in movement, almost no back and forth in decision. Eliminating indecision is one of the most important things you can do to get better at Dota. I talk about it a lot in my coaching sessions, so check them out if you haven't already. I will always sell out my own coaching sessions. I think they are incredibly educational, and I think if you care about getting better at Dota and putting in the effort to do so, they are the best tool out there. Do you think PL is fucking cheese? Not really. I think there's a lot of heroes in Dota that are really good with no counters. PL's one of them. You could argue him being a cheese hero for sure. Will Ritsu ever win TI? Yeah, absolutely not. I will eat my shoe if Ritsu wins TI. Is Ember good versus Sniper? Not really in lane, but in game, yeah. What are the three best items for Ember mid and safe lane? Seems like most people go for Spirit Vessel plus a damage item, so they either go like Deso or Maelstrom into like BKB or Ags. Your streams are pretty educational too. That's all I got going for me, buddy. That's what I gotta do. When is it legit to pick Carrie Lesh? I'm not entirely sure. Arteezy picks it a lot when I pick Mars. Seems really nice against Mars. Um, I honestly don't know how to describe Lush to you. It's a tough hero to pick carry. I'd say if you're lower MMR, it's probably just better to stay away from Lush. Are you still playing position 3? Yes, primarily. That's what I would plan to play next season. I climbed from 1.3k to 4.8k watching BSJ Coach. Thanks for that sponsored message. Make sure to check your PayPal and ensure you got the payment. Why is RTZ so strong in the landing stage? All the things I teach in my coaching sessions, he just does better than everyone else. All the concepts of lane and creep aggro, understanding power spikes, lane equilibrium manipulation, all that kind of stuff. Do you think orgs will drop their players due to COVID? Most likely. Most teams have already. Any team that's not like tier 1 will most likely drop all of their players if they're not regional. Like, I would see why EG would probably not drop their players, because they have enough money to continue supporting. But a lot of these, like, Tier 2, Tier 3 organizations, they don't have money to just willy-nilly throw around. Is LC a legit counter to Sniper? Maybe in low MMR pubs, but on average, no. I don't enjoy playing Legion into Sniper. He basically created some concepts. Like, isn't he the first person to abuse Lane Equilibrium on mid? I don't believe so. Maybe. Hard to keep track of who did what first. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to be watching the progress of Monkey's team. I I hope... I wish Monkey's the best, but I have little to no faith in NA teams in general, so... I'll be keeping an eye out for them next season, see how they do. You know, it's funny. I really shouldn't have been in denial about Pango for a long time. Because this reminds me of, like, four years ago, when nobody was picking Abaddon. And then this Logan buffed Grace guy, who just played, like, a thousand games of Abaddon, was suddenly ranked 10. He just only played Abaddon. That was all he played. And then suddenly he was ranked 10. Like, when I say suddenly, it's just like... He was just ranked 10 playing all Abaddon. 
And eventually people were like, wait a minute, this hero seems pretty fucking good. I think you guys know what I'm getting at here. What do you think of Slardar and latest updates? I think Slardar's pretty bad right now. I'm definitely curious to see where Luki Luki ends up when Pango is no longer good. I'm very curious, actually. She suggested color, suggested that I... Uh, name, or I name the sessions, like these 10 minute Q&A sessions called Q&A, where the Q is, you know, like queuing up for a game. I thought that was really clever. Here's a quirky question. What is your mouse DPI and what's the most important setting in Dota 2? Uh, mouse DPI? I don't even know. To be honest with you, I just adjust it based on how I feel like I've been playing for a long time. And then, uh, most important setting, I would say quick cast. Luki is mechanically very skilled, so it just comes down to whether or not he can turn that into any conceptual knowledge, which we'll see. Do any heroes really beat TA mid? Uh, Batrider, Ember doesn't necessarily... It's a lot of, like, SF-type matchups where you don't necessarily beat TA directly most of the time, but if your hero can threaten TA with a plus one, your hero is usually pretty good. Like Viper, Venno, Bat... Bat definitely wins. Uh, like Monkey King, Ember. What are some of the creative ways to use certain items you can think of? I know I learned another important use of BKB is allowing split push with BKB TP. Creative use of items. Uh, buying Shadow Blade so that you can position yourself better to blink. It's probably like a, what I would consider a pretty simple example, but a lot of people don't seem to understand that when they watch item builds. You're like a blink-based hero, and you're worried about them seeing you before you blink, so you buy a Shadow Blade. Doesn't Huskar destroy TA mid? Not really, no. Do you have a quick cast guide on YouTube? I don't believe so. Is picking LC against Quap a good idea? In lane? Meh. In game? Probably not either. I don't know. LC doesn't stand out to me as good or super bad against Quap. My buddy is a Batrider spammer. What are your favorite hero options for laning with him? Uh, so the way I think about all offlaners, and people in general, is how they play the game. Batrider overall is mediocre level 1. Uh, he likes to be aggressive though, so he offers a lot of kill potential with Sticky Napalm. Uh, unless the opponent carry doesn't give a shit about Sticky Napalm. But even then, he usually offers pretty good aggression. He likes melee heroes most of the time. Doesn't mean he is required to have a melee hero. But most notably, Batrider, around level 3, is going to start cutting the creep wave. And he's going to... Um, just play for his own game and basically stop laning at level 3. So if he's going to stop laning, he may be even earlier, depending on the lane matchup. If he's going to stop laning and your support has nothing he can do... Then you just need to, like, you, your support basically needs to be able to fuck off when he's, when Batrider's level 3. So, like, yesterday I had a guy pick Lion and just be, like, the fact that the guy picked Lion with Batrider already tells me he has no idea what he's fucking doing. But, like, uh, your hero just has to be willing to leave the lane and, and like, go do whatever. Gank bot, like, if we're a Radiant, go gank bottom, go gank mid, go check runes, go arrow some jungle creeps as, like, Marana. So, like, I want, like, a roaming 4 that doesn't care about fucking off when, uh, Batrider's level 3. And then can potentially come back to Batrider's lane and gank for it. Uh, because what Batrider generally does, rinse and repeat, is that he cuts the wave, gets super fucking farmed, because he is farming jungle camps and, far and cutting creeps at the same time. And then he wants to be able to be aggressive with his, like, level 5, 6, 7 timing. So you want heroes that fuck off for, like, 3 or 4 levels, and then come back and gank for you. So that's the description of hero I want you to be.